Hi, um, this is Mr. Fusco, and I, I thought what we would try is um, going through some PowerPoints as we go through these difficult times. Uh, I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit. Um, we we before we left for for this this untimely break, we're talking about ecology of the seas, and so I thought what I'd do is go through some of this PowerPoint and see how it goes, and um, so here we go. You probably want to take some notes that of things that I talk about that aren't in here and just kind of follow along and, and this will be this will be class time. So here we go. Um, we we've already started talking about these things, so I'm gonna kind of zip through some of this. We we talked about how scientists like to classify organisms based on their lifestyles. So that's one way to classify them. So um, we talked about benthos, which are the bottom dwellers. And if you remember, we said that epi means on the surface. So epifauna means animals that live on the surface of the bottom. That would be things like crabs and barnacles that are attached to the rocks and anything that would be living on the surface of the bottom. Epiflora. Flora sounds kind of like flower. Epiflora means the plant-like organisms that are living on the bottom. So that would be things like, uh, I hate this word, seaweed, um, or, or what I like to say, algae, um, that you would see like hanging on the rocks when the, when it, at low tide. Um, well, they go under the water as well. So anything that lives on the bottom that would be plant-like would be epiflora. In fauna are those things like clams and worms that, that actually live buried in, in the sand or in the mud or in the sediment. Um, pelagic are those organisms that live in the water itself, not attached to the bottom or not on the bottom. And we divided those up into those that can swim and those that can't. So those that can't swim against the current are the plankton. And technically it's a two knot current, which is pretty quick. Um, and so those that can swim against the current would be necktie. Plankton we're going to get heavily into, and I have some assignments that we're going to do, and um, we're, we're going to we're going to learn a lot about different kinds of plankton. The necktie would be things like fish that can swim against the current, or whales, um, or the the only invertebrate I think we talked about it in class, but the only in invertebrate that I could think of offhand. That would be nectonic would be the, the squid. So there's a bunch of different kinds of squids, but they're nectonic. They can swim against the current. Okay. So just to, just to kind of um, recap, plankton are the drifters. They drift along with whatever the water is doing. They go. Necton are the swimmers, and benthos are the bottom dwellers. So we say benthos is the noun. Benthic would be the adjective. Um, Okay, so between the low tide mark, you know, between where the water is always there and where the and the and the edge of the continental shelf is called the neuritic zone. Beyond the continental shelf, the pelagic area is called the oceanic zone, and the oceanic zone is divided into a bunch of of zones. Remember, epi means the surface, so epipelagic is the top layer, the, the surface layer of the water. Another way to say that is euphotic. Euphotic means it's, it's the area that sunlight goes into that you could see that's, that's bright enough for photosynthesis to happen is, is the technical definition. The mesopelagic, meso means middle, right, but... Um, it's the it's where sunlight goes, but not bright enough for photosynthesis to happen. So we call that the twilight zone. The bathypelagic zone is the deep ocean water. Abyssal pelagic, think about the abyss, right? Really deep. And then the deepest water is the hadal pelagic. Hadal means hell. So literally, hadal pelagic means deep as hell. Okay, so here's a little graphic that I hope will help you to understand. It shows you that the surface waters to about 200 meters. Uh, it depends on where you are. In the northeast, 
with a lot of things in the water, a lot of life, a lot of material in the water, that is way shallower. In the tropics, like like the Caribbean, like Bahamas, Bonaire, Puerto Rico, um, those areas are uh, much. The water is much clearer. There's not as much stuff, so that would be much lower. Okay, the mesopelagic zone is like I said, the twilight zone. That's where some light gets into, but not a lot. So they call it the twilight zone. The midnight zone is the next level, the bathopelagic zone. It goes to about 4,000 meters, which is pretty deep. Um, and so it's dark and it's deep, and um, but it's not the deepest. The abyssal pelagic zone is the abyss. It's where the it's it's the really deep ocean. And then if you get into the trenches, which are which are the deepest areas in the ocean like the Marianas Trench, um, the Challenger Deep is about 36,000 feet. Um, and so that's, that's really deep. It's almost seven miles deep. So that's the, those are the, the zones that, or, and we found life all the way down. So all the way down into the hadopelagic zone, we've found life. Um, another grouping is based on the tides. If you're, if you're living in between the high and the low tide, they call that intertidal or the littoral zone. If you're always submerged, you're, you're in the subtidal zone. Sub means below. So the sublittoral zone is always wet. And then we've got the baffle pelagic zone, the abyssal pelagic zone, and the hadal pelagic zone. Those are the deep ocean floors. Um, I already said it, but the outer continent, outer um, o over the continental shelf is the neuritic zone. Beyond that is the oceanic. So the deep ocean would be the oceanic zone. Um, so we, we've, we've talked in biology and, and we haven't really talked a whole lot here, but, but if you remember biotic, bio means life. So biotic factors are those living things, those living factors that affect organisms. So, Competition is here, predation, you know, like predator and prey and those kinds of things would be biotic factors. If you put an A in front of something, it means non or not. So the abiotic parts of the environment would be would be the the non-living factors. That would be things like the temperature, the salinity, the pressure, because it, as you go deeper and deeper, there's more and more pressure. So the amount of pressure. Would be those would be abiotic factors. We're going to kind of concentrate on the biotic factors. So let's talk a little bit. Um, we talk about predator prey relationships. There's a spotted moray on the left. There's um, there's a sea star on the right. The sea star that you're looking at is Asterius forbesi. It's the Forbes sea star. I took that in um, in Waterford, which is about an hour from here. Not quite an hour, maybe 45 minutes. The the moray eel that you're looking at, you can see they they don't mess around. They have serious teeth. They can they can really you know eat things. So they're obviously a predator. But if you look at that sea star, it's on a rock, and on the rock are Crepidula fornicata, which are the slipper shells. And so that sea star is eating those those slipper shells. So. The predator is the thing that does the, the hunting, killing, and eating. The prey is the organism that gets eaten. Okay? Um, we probably know these terms, but just to review, carnivore eats other animals. Herbivore eats only plants, and an omnivore eats both. Okay? So the, so the sea star is actually a carnivore. Jellyfish are carnivores because they only eat living, you know, other animals. Um, whales would be carnivores, okay? Sharks are obviously carnivores. Um, things like like uh, manatees and and dugongs are herbivores. We'll we'll get into those. Those are really cool. But we'll get into those later. Um, okay. So we talk about symbiosis, and one of the things you should, we've done it in biology, but one of the things you should know is. Symbiosis is an intimate 
and prolonged relationship between two organisms of different species in which at least one benefits. So if you look at this little graphic, a, a good way to remember it is the mutualist, the commensal, or the parasite always benefits. Uh, otherwise, why do it? But if you're helping the other organism, it's mutualism. If you're, if you're not affecting the other organism, it's commensalism. And if you're hurting the other organism, it's parasitism. So let's go through some of these together. What you're looking at here is, um, this is, this is Pagoras polycaris, the, the, the hermit crab. And living on them, see that fuzzy stuff? That fuzzy stuff is actually a, um, an, a colony of an organism called Hydractinia econata. It's snail fur. And that snail fur, they're, though, each of those little fuzzy things is, is an individual animal. They're all connected, so it's a colony. And they have stinging cells. So they help protect the crab, um, and the crab carries them around, and when the crab eats, they get to eat some of the scraps, um, and it works out really well for both of them. So that would be an, a good example of mutualism. Here's another one. I, I took this one in Bonaire, but this is a Peterson shrimp, and the Peterson shrimp lives in the tentacles of an anemone. Remember, remember um, Finding Nemo? Nemo lives in an anemone, and then then don't hurt yourself. Remember, so the tentacles of the anemone there have singing cells too, and they help to protect the shrimp. The shrimp actually will lure critters into the anemone to to have the anemone feed. It will also actually go out and get food for the anemone and feed it. It also keeps it clean, and the anemone protects it, gives it a place to live. So, so it's another example of really good example of mutualism. One more. We're gonna we're gonna do a whole unit on corals and coral reefs and and this is orange cup coral. I think they're beautiful. If you look, the orange color is actually because of a little um, a, a little plankton-like organism called a dinoflagellate that lives in the tissues of the of the corals. The little dinoflagellate is, is a zooxanthellae, is the name of it. And so the zooxanthellae is photosynthetic. When it makes its own food it, from the sunlight, it makes extra. The coral gets a lot of that nutrition. The coral provides the zooxanthellae with a place to live and protection. And so it works out really, really nice. If, if those corals aren't in sunlight, they die because they need the zooxanthellae to survive. And the zooxanthellae need them to survive. So it works out really well. That's mutualism. Here's a really good example of, of commensalism. This is a horseshoe crab, Limulus polyphemus. And if you look at the little white dots all over it, those are barnacles. The barnacles don't really affect the horseshoe crab at all. Limulus polyphemus goes about its business and doesn't worry about anything. And um, the the barnacles live on it, get carried around, but they, they don't really affect it. So because the barnacles live on the horseshoe crab, they glue themselves down for life. They the the they benefit, but the horseshoe crab doesn't isn't really affected. Okay. Um, this is a picture I took down in Bonaire. Uh, of a of a jack it's a it's a bar jack and it's swimming along with a southern stingray um wherever the stingray went the bar jack went and so you would tend to think well maybe that's commensalism because the stingray doesn't get affected and the bar jack follows them around for some food or whatever but but i don't think that that's a, a symbiotic relationship because I don't think it's intimate. When I say intimate, I mean an organism living on or in another organism. So so that's just a, so a food for thought. Okay, so when we talk about trophic levels, we're talking about feeding levels. Trophic means feeding. Um, and so we, there's two broad categories. There are producers, 
Those are the autotrophs. Those are the plant-like things that can make their own food. And then there are heterotrophs, which are the consumers. And we've done this in biology, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But you should know food chain represents the transfer of energy from one level to the next. Um, it represents one pathway of of transfer of energy. So, in other words, diatoms are eaten by copepods that are eaten by mussels, that are eaten by small fish, that are eaten by large fish, that are eaten by the whales. That would be one possible scenario. But, but it's really way more complicated than that. And so if you really wanted to see how things work, you need a food web. A food web is a whole bunch of food chains that overlap and intersect. And, and here's an example of a food, chain, a food web. And you can see that, that the phytoplankton over on the left get eaten by a number of things. Um, you can see that krill gets eaten by almost everything. Um, and so you can follow this, this transfer of energy with a whole series of different pathways. And that would be a food web. So a food web is really just a whole bunch of food chains all put together in some kind of a meaningful way. Okay, we also have decomposers and, um, and those things like bacteria and fungi that break down the dead organic material into inorganic materials like carbon dioxide, water, um, and, and other inorganic compounds, nitrates, nitrites. Okay, um, let's see. Productivity. I think you could read that. I'm not going to. Okay. So um, another thing that we really talk about in, in this class that I'd like to talk about in this class is how organisms are categorized in science. I don't, we don't really do a whole lot of this in bio like we, like we probably should, but, but scientists, like to classify things so that we can keep things organized. So there are a couple, there are, there are three different, what we call domains that are huge categories of organisms. And the, those are really based on whether they're eukaryotic, which means they have nuclei or prokaryotic, which means they don't. So if you think about most back, all bacteria, bacteria don't have a nucleus. They would be in, in the prokaryotic side, right? And there's two possibilities. It depends on how their cell wall and their, is constructed. But, but let's just say that there are two categories. There's domain bacteria, which are the real bacteria, the true bacteria. So they're in a group called eubacteria in a kingdom. The other ones are domain ar archaea, which are the old, old, old type of bacteria been around for billions of years. Those are the archaebacteria. Those things are kind of special. Those are the extremophiles, which means they like really salty places or really hot places or, or really cold places. They are, ex they live in extreme um, environments. But those things we're not really going to concentrate we're going to concentrate on the eukaryotic organisms, organisms that have nuclei. So there are really four, they're in domain eukarya, and there's four kingdoms that you're probably aware of, at least three of them. You know about animals, that's animalia. You know about plants, that's plantae. The fungi would be things like mushrooms and molds and yeasts. Um, and and um, so, so. There's not a whole lot of fungi in the ocean, but um, we're going to concentrate on the animals and plants and the other one called protista, which you started reading a little bit about in, in the assignments that I've already given you. Protista are the single-celled uh, beasties. Um, some, it's kind of like a catch-all. If you can't figure out where to put something, because it's plant-like and animal-like, and you don't really know where to put it in. It's kind of colonial. You would put it in protista. So that's kind of a catch-all. But, but this slide is actually a really good summary of categorizing 
organisms. So, so um, one of the things that I'd like you to kind of understand is this idea of phylogenetic classification. How do we organize living things? And so the biggest category is domain, that we have kingdoms like animals and plants and fungi. Then in, in there are phyla, and we're going to spend our time on a number of animal phyla. So we're going to talk about phyla and classes is the next category. So phylum would be things like arthropods. And under arthropoda, phylum arthropoda, are a number of classes. And we'll get to class insecta and class crustacea and those kinds of things. And then within those are a bunch of orders. Within those are a bunch of families. And then when we get down to the, the names of organisms, we pretty much use two names, the genus and the species. So when I say Arbacea punctulata, Arbacea is the genus, punctulata is the, is the species. Uh, you'll notice that down at the bottom of this thing, Arbacea is capitalized, punctulata is lowercase, the P is lowercase, and they are italics. So when we write them, that's how we do that. If because we can't italicize when we write something by hand, we underline it. But when you'll see things in this class and in science books and whatnot, the, the way that we write those things is we capitalize the genus, lowercase the, the species, and it's italicized. So Arbacea punctulata is the purple sea urchin that's around here. Homerus americanus is the North American lobster. That's the thing that many of us like to eat. Um, one of the longest, not, not one of, the longest scientific name of any animal on Earth is the green sea urchin, Strongylocentrotus drobachiensis. Um, and, and I'll show you pictures, and, and I actually have some. If, when we get back to school, I can pull them out and show them to you. Um, but so... I want you to understand kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. There, there's a mnemonic that you may have learned. Um, King Philip came over for great spaghetti, and, and you can add the domain because that's fairly new. So you can say, did King Philip come over for great spaghetti? It's a, it's a mnemonic. It's a way to remember things. So, so you need to remember kingdom, do, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and then species. All right, so plankton. One of the things that I really want to talk a lot about is, is plankton. It comes from the Greek word to wander. Drift along, the drifters. They're carried about by water currents. They can move up and down, um, but they typically can't fight the current. Not typically. They can't fight the current. They're usually small, but they can be pretty big. We talked about it the other day in class. The the Sienna capillata, the lion's mane jellyfish that's around here, the red one that you'll see at, at the ocean um, up north, can get to 13 feet in diameter. So that's a big plankton. Most of them are tiny because if they're tiny, they can stay up in the water column much better. Okay, so again, we talked about this in class, but phyto means plant-like. Zo, plankton, are animal-like plankton. So those are the two major groupings of plankton, and then there are subcategories. Um, we'll get to them as we go along. Phytoplankton are the, um, are the plant-like plankton. Most of them are single-celled. Some of them are colonial. You'll see some, some colonial um, diatoms. Cyanobacteria, the blue-green bacteria, are, are also phytoplankton. They can actually take an if you remember the nitrogen cycle from biology where they can take nitrogen from the atmosphere or nitrogen dissolved in the water and convert it to a usable form for, for living things. So cyanobacteria is kind of special. Um, here's another one. Coccolithophores. Coccolithophores are so cool, I think. They're really cool. They have these plates. Um, four, you'll, you'll hear, you'll hear P-H-O-R-E or F-O-R-E. It means has. So coccolithophores have these coccoliths, which is a, a plate. And I think they're kind of pretty, but they're really tiny. 
Um, yeah, so that's a picture of one there, a micro, an electron micrograph of a coccolithophorid. They're, they're pretty neat. Um, diatoms are another group. One of the biggest groups of phytoplankton are the diatoms. Um, you read about them in, in the homework that I've given you. Uh, they have a, a glass cell wall, which is pretty cool. And it's kind of like two petri dishes. You know, a petri dish has the two parts that, that one fits over the one piece fits over the other. That's kind of the way the diatom cell wall is. They are the most abundant and most obvious members of the phytoplankton. They go from really small to good size. One millimeter is, is visible with a naked eye. They are, I think, really pretty. Here's some pictures of different kinds of diatoms. I think they're, I think they're beautiful. And, and I like the way that they're so small, but so detailed. I, I think that's really, really cool. All glass. Those are the shells. Um, here's a, an electron micrograph of them. The yellowish ones, the golden colored ones are actually stacked up on the, each other. It's pretty neat. Okay. Dinoflagellates are the other largest, other of the two, they're, they're one of the two largest groups. We got the, uh, the diatoms and the dinoflagellates. If somebody's a pyro, it means they like fire, right? So pyrophyta literally means fire plant because many of these things glow, which is really cool. Um, I have some on order that I wanted to show you that glow. Unfortunately, I can't show them to you right now, but we'll talk anyway. Um, okay, so there's not very many that aren't photosynthetic, but dinoflagellate literally means two flagella. So one of them goes around the middle, and one of them is used like like a, a normal flagella. It kind of pushes the or the anum the the protist along. Um, these guys are the things that are in the the coral that I was talking about before. The zooxanthellae are kind of dinoflagellate. Um, they have asexual reproduction, so there's only one parent. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about is this idea of blooms. A, a, a bloom, a phytoplankton bloom, or a plankton bloom, means that the population goes crazy. Um, they, they, they get so many that they can actually color the water and cause some issues. Some people have called them red tides, but scientists have changed that to harmful algal blooms because they're not always red. So if you've heard of red tides, that's what we're talking about. If you haven't, um, then we're going we're gonna to get used to using harmful algal blooms. Uh, this is what a dinoflagellate looks like. These are some, some really common dinoflagellates, and you can see that, that they have a, a groove. I don't know if I can do this. They have a groove that goes around the middle that a, a um, flagella wraps around, and then they have a flagellum that kind of hangs out. I, I don't worry about all these other terms. It's no big deal. Here's a, here's a really interesting one. Um, this is Fisteria. This is the one I was talking about in class where scientists were working with this one and they actually, it, it produces a neurotoxin so that you get amnesia. And the scientists that were working with this actually forgot how to use a telephone. They forgot where they lived on the way home. So pretty cool looking thing. Pretty scary. It can, it can do some real um, harmful effects. This is this is the bioluminescent bay in in Puerto Rico, and you can see that that the it's glowing because of dinoflagellates. I think I think that's really cool. Um, okay, zooplankton. We have two categories of zooplankton. We have the meroplankton, which spend part of their lives as plankton, which would be things like larvae. So if you see um, baby clam, you know, lar clam larva, crab larva, 
worm larva that's going to change into something else, then it's probably a meroplankton. If they spend their whole life as plankton, then they're holoplankton. You can remember whole life holoplankton. Um, and that would be things like copepods and jellyfish and, and anything that would be, that would be always be a plankton. Okay. Uh, I took this picture of, this is, this is Crepidula fornicata, a, um, this is the larva. It's called a villager larva. And you can see that it's carrying its own yolk. Um, this is its intestine. It actually has eyes. This is actually its heart. You can actually see it beating when it's alive. Very, very cool thing. This is the foot. And then this is the velum, which is why they call it a villager larva. And this, they swim around in the, in the water column feebly. So they can't really swim against the current, but they can swim up and down and they can move around a bit. Um, very, very cool critters. I think they're really cute. Um, here's some other ones. This one here is a, is a worm larva called a polychaete. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. This is, this is a, this is going to settle down and be a worm. These are, are actually crab larva. These are zoea, crab zoea. So they're going to become a crab, which is going to settle out into the, onto the bottom and become epifauna, which is benthic, benthos. Uh -huh. This is, this is actually a, a baby lobster. So that would be all of the, well, let's see. This is meroplankton. This is meroplankton and that's meroplankton. So all those are meroplankton. Um, okay, so we have zooplankton, which includes the meroplankton, protozoan plankton, flagellates and ciliates is, is kind of like how they move. Um, foraminifera are, are really pretty. They, are, they have a, a shell, what we call a test, made of calcium carbonate, which is the same stuff that snail shells are made of. They are microscopic. They have chambers, which is pretty cool. I'd love to show you in the microscopes. And if we can go to ham and ass it, we'll, we'll probably end up with some. Um, they're related to um, amoeba. They have these, these cytoplasmic extensions, they call it. They have these things that stick out of the, out of the test or shell. Um, really pretty. Um, they are the things that form chalk beds. So they are, they, they make chalk up. Um, here are pictures and you can see that they have chambers and these things that are sticking out, all these little ray looking things are all pseudopods. They call them false feet. I think they're really pretty. I, I just, and they're tiny. You could barely see them with the naked eye, but you can see them. Um, okay. Radiolarian are the next ones. I, those are probably my favorite. They have a glass shell. Um, if you've ever seen, um, the Big Bang Theory, the, they are the critters that are on the Big Bang Theory that when they, when they do those splash screens. Really cool. Um, that's a radiolarian. How pretty is that? All glass and microscopic. Okay. Some other ones include copepods, which are really small crustaceans. We'll, again, I want to show them to you under the microscope. So when we get back, if we can, I'd love to have them for you. I have some slides of them. We'll, we'll see what we can do. But copepods are the most abundant zooplankton anywhere, everywhere on Earth. They pretty much eat phytoplankton, but, but, um, plankton on SpongeBob was modeled after a copepod. He, he is a copepod. That's a copepod. This one, this is a copepod here. And this, this one we got in Ham and Asset on one of the trips with a marine biology class. So I, I took his picture, but this thing here is a copepod. And see how it has the one eye and it has the, the, the appendages at the, at the head end. The, that's plankton from SpongeBob. Here's another picture of a different one. 
This is a calanoid copepod. These things are egg sacs. So those are eggs. Pretty cool. And their eyes typically are red, which is really neat. Or oftentimes they're red. This is krill. You ate one in class. They, they form swarms in the ocean. Whales eat them. Fish eat them. Everything eats them. But there's, there's billions. And, um, I think they're kind of pretty. Very cool. So, they're little shrimp-like dudes that swim around, but can't swim against the current. Um, so that's krill. When you, when you talk about whales, that's kind of what baleen whales eat. The whales that kind of filter feed. Okay. I took this picture in Rhode Island. This is, this is a, a, a salp. This is actually a, a, a link between animals with and without backbones. I think it's really kind of cool. Um, they, these, this is a colony and they kind of just float in the, in the water and they filter feed and they just kind of are attached to each other. Really cool critters. They don't look like a whole lot, but they're pretty complicated. Here's some other zooplankton. Um, this guy here is a sea butterfly. I, I, think they're beautiful. They're probably the, the length of your index fingernail, you know, your, your, your pointer finger fingernail. Um, I, I saw these in Massachusetts a few years ago and got some pictures. They are just really pretty. These guys are also called sea butterflies. This is Cleon limacina. Um, very, very cool. See, the, these guys and these guys are arrow worms. Um, they're really tiny. They, too, are probably, well, they might be the length of your pinky fingernail. Um, but they're clear. They're, they're hard to see. But we get some in, in plankton toes from, from ham and acid. So these guys are actually snails without a shell that are swimming around. And they call those pteropods. Terra is wing. So you'll notice that these guys, oh, sorry. These guys have these wing-like appendages that help them to swim around. Those are, those are pteropods. Okay. Um, so how do plankton stay afloat? How do they, how do they stay off the bottom? So in order to be plankton, you have to be in the water column. How do you do that? Well, the first thing is you want to, in one possibility is you want to increase water resistance. It's kind of like, when somebody jumps out of an airplane with a parachute, it slows their descent because there's so much um, air resistance in the in the in, the, in a um, parachute. But if you can get flat and wide, then you can kind of stay up in the water column much easier. Also, smaller organisms have a much higher surface area to volume ratio, so they can stay up in the water column easier. Think about it. Dust in your house. If you've ever seen like a sun shining through the, through the window in the summertime and you can see like the dust pieces kind of floating in the air, they're floating in the air because it doesn't take a whole lot to, to make them float around because they're tiny. They have a high surface area to volume ratio because they're tiny. So small is what's going to help them. The other thing is, um, if you're flat and wide, you're, you, you, you're much better able to stay up in the water. Um, also, if you're, if you're flat and wide, you end up doing like, if you do, do me a favor, take a piece of paper and hold it up about head height and then just let it go. And you'll see that it zigzags on the way down. That zigzaggy is what's helping it to stay up. Also, as it's moving like that, there's more water passing over it, so it's more efficient at, at getting oxygen in and out, carbon dioxide in and out, right? Um, so it, it helps it to survive. Some, many, plankton have spines. So this, the, the first one is increased water resistance. Second one is spines. Organisms with spines tend to be able to take, they have a higher surface area to volume ratio and they stay up in the water much better. Um, and then other things, another one is, is 
because fat floats. You, you know if you have um, salad dressing that the oil floats on the vinegar because fat is less dense than water. So if you have a, a drop of fat in you, you can float better. Sharks actually have um, really, really fatty livers because there's a lot of oil in them because it helps them to float. They don't have what many other fish have, um, what's called a swim bladder. A lot of fish have this, it's a bag that they fill with gases and it helps them to stay wherever they want to be. Sharks don't have that, so they use oils. Well, just like they use oils, diatoms, copepods, fish eggs, those have a drop of oil in them and it helps them to stay up in the water. Um, the other thing is, if, if you've ever thrown a beach ball at the beach, you know that it's not going to sink, right? So as long as it's got air in it. So a lot of organisms use pockets of, of gases. And so those gases will help them to stay afloat. Examples would be the Portuguese man of war, which you can see a picture of here. They have these gas-filled floats, and it helps them to stay up. Cyanobacteria also have gas that helps them stay afloat. Okay, I'm going to stop here, and I'll put up another um, PowerPoint, the rest of this PowerPoint, another time. We'll get into this harmful algal blooms um, at, at another day, okay? Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I know thing, times are trying. Do the best you can, please, and, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Oh, don't.